I interviewed the CEO of one of the world's largest textile companies, shirt makers, and we spoke about the circular economy. And I, I asked him, who, who will pay for this? Because inevitably your t-shirts will cost more to manufacture. And I made a mistake because he said, no, 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 it won't. It, it all just pays for itself. Uh, but in hindsight, I think there really are four ways of paying that transition of resetting your supply chain, at least the investment in the short and midterm before it starts paying for itself, hopefully. Either I make the product more expensive, that means limited adoption of that more valuable product. Um, I try to push prices down in my supply chain, unlikely, especially now after this pandemic or in the midst of this pandemic when so many companies already have optimized their margins. Um, the risk gets paid by the taxpayer mm -hmm. through policy or the company is fine with a smaller margin for many years probably, which of course, if it's a publicly traded company is an issue with shareholders, yeah. like you said, short term versus long term. Mm -hmm. and, and so often you see CEOs trying to argue in the long term interest of a company only for the shareholders to move in and say, no, we're interested in the short term. And I, I wonder again that the, the concept of the circular economy is proven. Shouldn't most of the emphasis now go into these implementation risks and into the policy narratives to make it happen? I think there's no question that policy plays a, a very important part in this. You know, in our conversations we've been having now for many years with the European Commission, when businesses want to move, if there's a level playing field created by policy, it makes that transition easier. It makes that transition more straightforward and it makes that company more investable through that transition because the policy is clear. If you're an outlier trying to do something phenomenal, that's a, 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 a concerning but brave place to be. And some who do that will be absolute winners, but not all. So I think the policy plays a really important role, but there's also the role of the consumer. And we've seen that through the work we've been doing on plastic packaging. Suddenly, you know, post some of our reports and, and other um, uh, programs and articles around the, the subject of plastic pollution, suddenly there is a massive wave that really concerns the FMCG companies from the public saying this is not okay. Now, that in itself is a shareholder risk. That in itself is highlighting this linear system that, that is absolutely not destined to run in the long term. So there are pressures in many areas. And if you can get that consortia, as we have with the plastics mm -hmm. packaging sector, in agreement, this is where they're moving to. That makes it much clearer for the policymakers to then um, bring policy forward to help that transition, which then helps the investors to invest in that transition because everyone has this common, the common direction. You know, what we've seen in the past is many of these companies have had, you know, 100 innovations in 100 directions which don't add up to a solution, whereby it is a, you know, you go off over here or you go off over here, all with absolutely the best intentions, but that won't change the system. To change the system, you need everyone to agree this is where we're moving towards. It's these materials. It's, it's this distribution model. It's working towards getting products to people in a different way. Then you have a very different conversation with policymakers. You have a different conversation with your consumers, and that helps the whole system to shift, whereby you don't have those outliers going off on their own and, and, and putting themselves in that very vulnerable position. The problem is that it can't just be isolated companies or even, you know, kind of one government here and there, it really has to go to the center of how we actually think about economic change and societal change. And in fact, um, one of the things I've been trying to do over the years um, is trying to help governments redesign their policies. So it's less about kind of pet projects, whether it's around plastic or any sort of particular area. It's really about saying, what does it mean to actually design policy to be goal oriented? and less about kind of picking random sectors or even random types of technologies or types of firms, right? There's this obsession about small, medium enterprises. Instead of looking at a type of firm, type of technology, type of sector, what does it actually look like if you have goals that are ideally starting with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, there's 17 of them. Every country has signed up to them. There's 169 targets beneath them. But the problem is that if you just stop at the goals, they're quite broad, right? So, you know, SDG 13, you know, life underwater, clean oceans, what does it actually mean to turn that into a moonshot, right? Like a plastic free ocean over a certain amount of time and get as many different sectors involved in the process. So whether that's, you know, the chemical sector, or social innovation, biotech, design, AI, marine, and so on, they have to actually work together.
And that's what got us to the moon. I've just written a book on called Mission Economy that, you know, getting to the moon was not just about aerospace. It was lots of innovation and nutrition, materials, electronics, the whole software industry in some ways was a spillover of that. But the other thing is that government back then was much more confident, I find, and capable in some ways than many public institutions are today. And they really focused on how to work with business, how to actually design what I call a symbiotic mutualistic public-private partnership, and not what we see in some areas like health, where sometimes we have parasitic (laughs) public-private partnerships. So what does it mean to actually design the contracts themselves to be outcomes-oriented? The state, I really do think, at least in democratic societies, has the duty to actually set the direction for change, but then leave very open the how, right? You can't micromanage that process, but really setting a goal, you know, again, plastic-free ocean, carbon-neutral city, but also ones around inequality. And, you know, that kind of mindset of picking the willing, having a mission-oriented, outcomes-oriented approach to policy, crowding in as many bottom-up solutions, that just requires a huge cultural shift as well within the public service. It means, you know, experimenting, risk-taking, seeing yourself as a co-creator, co-shaper of markets of the future, not just a fixer of markets. Because one of the big systems problems we have is that we keep waiting for the system to break down or to maybe break down before we really think about any sort of government policy. And that's actually within the economic theory itself, which unfortunately is very powerful in terms of how policymakers think, which is that policy is seen as just fixing market failures. So by definition, you will always be too little too late. How would you advise business leaders to kind of step forward into into an environment that requires regulation? Because it is still the case that many businesses are pushing back on regulation all the time, almost regardless of what it is. How do, how do we help businesses change their stance to make this happen well? I, I, I go, it goes back to the beginning. Do we agree on the objective and goal? Do we agree on less waste to the environment and a circular economy because it has a lower carbon footprint uh, and this is a positive way forward and, and ultimately can be lower cost of business? If, if you agree with that as a premise, then everything else can become as consequence. And businesses very typically need to work in collaboration with each other. They need to form alliances. Governments find it much easier to deal with all manufacturers of a certain thing rather than each of them individually. And Mariana, in the picture that James is painting there, very similar to you, bring the whole system together. Do you feel that business has an opportunity or indeed a regulation, sorry, an opportunity or indeed a, a, a really an obligation to demonstrate to governments that what is possible. Because very often in, the, in making shift happen in a real way, in practical terms, regulators sometimes find it difficult to see what is actually possible. Has business got a role in making that come alive in the regulatory world? Sure, but can I just say, I, I want to start from a very different premise. You know, the state and the public sector is not there just to be a regulator. Everything that makes our iPhones smart and not stupid actually came from public investment, very risk-taking, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri. Same thing with renewable energy, most big innovations around solar, wind, marine, fusion, fracking even came actually from high-risk, early-stage public investments of different types. So let's just get out of this idea that, sorry if I'm being so bold on this, but this has been what I've been writing about for 20 years, the public sector also invests. And when they do so, they actually should be then governing the system around these technologies in in such a way to produce kind of public goods and public value. And we can come back to that later. But I do think that just the narrative that this is just about regulation, as opposed to collectively creating value in particular ways. And I definitely agree with James. If then the regulation is wrong, if the environment is not certain for businesses to actually be able to be rewarded for doing the good thing, as opposed to kind of, you know, whether it's problematic tax policy or, you know, regulations that are just kind of badly devised, that's a huge problem 